Yes, hello everybody. Um, my name is Stanislas and I'm an alien. Uh, I'm not an alien because I'm French. I'm an alien because of this one year, solar energy. So for you hydropower people, I'm, I'm completely out of this world. And I was, uh, I'm gonna tell you a bit about my, my PhD topic and, and try to begin by introducing you into my world with some uh, market numbers. Um, solar energy is cool. Solar energy is cool for what? Because it's becoming crazy. So we started from nothing 20 years ago, and now we got uh, 100 gigawatts built every year, installed capacity, new capacity, with a 30% 30% growth in the industry, uh, which makes it quite interesting. I'm gonna go quick by that just to give you a, a glimpse. Um, it's not going to stop here. We have some projections. We might double it on the low scenarios before 2023, so in the five years to come. Um, some numbers from last year too, that's the installed, new installed capacity per energy source. And we built so 100 gigawatt of PV last year, which is way bigger than all the other energy sources. New capacity built in 2018. Um, yeah, so interesting. Why is it so interesting now? Uh, because of the costs. And I couldn't find a new one because it's going too fast for the, these crazy consultant companies to follow up. Uh, so it's stopping here. 2011, that's the price of the solar panels uh, per watt, per, per capacity, going from seven to, what is it here, Yeah, two something, and now we are about 20 cents in 2019. So that would be somewhere here, well, here or something. But just, just completely crazy. Uh, we don't expect to stop it yet. I guess at some point it's not, it's not gonna be free, right? Uh, it might stay at some level, uh, it's gonna stabilize. But that's a 90% reduction uh, since 2010, so not even 10 years, 90% reduction in the total cost of in new PV capacity. Which also means this graph is completely unreadable. Uh, but just solar PV is here, that's the LCOE, so the levelized cost of electricity, that's the price per kilowatt hour during the lifetime. Coming from here to here, which is one of the lowest, that's a global average in the world, uh, together with wind, lower than coal, lower than uh, diesel, lower than, uh, than uh, atom craft, lower than uh, nuclear. Uh, so yeah, that's a cheap source of energy. We have this article, very new, that was last week, uh, IEA, the um, International Energy Agency, issued a new report uh, saying that, okay, solar energy might be the first, uh, the biggest source of energy by 2035, so in, in only 15 years. Um, okay, interesting, that was just a glimpse in my world, <laughs> just to tell you it's cool. Uh, now, what is the link with, uh, with hydrocene and with, uh, with hydropower? Problem with that, well, problems, because there are many, of course, the viability of solar PV, of black like wind, uh, that's, that's a problem for grid, uh, grid acceptance. Um, the other one is the land it takes. That needs huge pieces of land to build, uh, to build solar PV. So some people, uh, that comes from Asia, they had a brilliant idea, why not building solar PV on water? Uh, water is very often less used uh, for agriculture, right? So they came with this new concept. It's uh, some years old. Uh, it's still a niche in, uh, in the PV industry. And the only difference is that instead of having these solar panels built on the ground, we just put it on some floating structure, and then we export the production on land for all of the power electronics and grid connected and all the rest is. Uh, Onshore. So, well, several advantages, I won't go into details, but of course the uh, land requirements are, are less, so that's also a cost, right? You have to lease the land or to buy the land. Very often water is a bit easier. Um, and you have this incredible effect. Solar PV, you might not know, but it produces better when it's cold. You need two inputs, you need solar radiation, the higher the better, and temperature, and the lower the better. And with solar PV on water, you get this natural cooling, which increases your production up to 10, 15, 20%, according to the system. Yeah, so that's, uh, that's the thing. Um, floating PV, uh, as said, is still a niche. That's the numbers for last year. That's 1.3 gigawatt. So to be 
put into comparison with the 500 gigawatts built of, uh, of PV, mainstream PV. So still a niche, but following the same curve. It's increasing a lot. The so World Bank issued a report now in October saying that the potential would be of 4 gigawatt uh, installed globally. So potential is enormous, but it takes some time. Some examples of technology, the main used is this one, so that's some kind of plastic HDPE float where you build your solar panels and they're, they're assembled together like that with some pathways for maintenance and you deploy it on, uh, on reservoirs uh, or water bodies. You also have this kind of Norwegian solution uh, on the Norwegian fjord, uh, on salt water, well, many other challenges, but they're doing quite well, um, but that's not the topic of this presentation. I had a small movie, let's see if it works, maybe not. Um, yeah, we don't have to watch everything, that just to, to give you an idea of how it works, because it's quite easy to deploy. Do you need the sound? Not at all, thank you. <laughs> yeah, so that's one project in, uh, in the UK. Uh, it's a small one on a drinking water reservoir. On, uh, it's called the Queen Elizabeth Reservoir. So I thought this movie was quite amazing. Yeah, because everything can be built onshore and then you just push it on the water. It's so easy. Uh, so you actually don't have that much work on the water, on boats, and all of this costly uh, construction uh, time and, and efforts. You just push it. So you can walk on it. It's not very stable. I wouldn't go there on a, on a very extreme weather. But yeah, and then they push these blocks and they assemble the blocks together. You do all the cable work from panel to panel on land and then you export with, uh, with offshore cables, everything to the land, to the shore. Well, for this one, for the anchoring, because the reservoir is quite deep, they needed some divers which is not always the case, of course, uh, depends on the, on the reservoir, on the water body, the bathymetry and everything. Um, yeah. Yeah, well, okay. Back to if I, yes, perfect. Yeah, so that's, uh, that's a new niche in, in, uh, in the solar industry, uh, which is quite interesting in my opinion. But then of course, could we, build it on hydropower reservoirs and enjoy, because there are many benefits, and I will come back to that, but that's, that's a potential. Just some numbers, that's from CERIS, the Solar Energy Research Institute of Singapore, uh, which is working quite a lot on that. They put, just to see the potential, so you have some big dams, big, big ones in the world, the country, the size of the reservoir in square kilometers, and the hydropower uh, capacity. And just to see the potential, they calculated how much of the area of the reservoir you would need to build the same capacity. It's not feasible, but just to assess the potential. So if you have 690 square kilometers, how much do you need to build 2.4 gigawatts? For this one, you would need 3% of the reservoir in terms of area. So 3% of 690 kilo square meters to build 2.4 gigawatts, uh, less than 1% for several of them. So just to, just to show you the potential, that's enormous. That would be a small part of the reservoir for these big dams to double the capacity in practice, in theory. Um, yeah, so potential is big. The benefits are many, of course, in a, in a solar perspective. You have limited land use, so you can build it in areas where you could not increase the capacity that easily. Um, we're thinking mostly of course, Southeast Asia, for example, they have issues with people. Uh, you have to remove people when you use that amount of land. Um, but also some places in Africa, for example, where, uh, where the grid is where the hydropower is, which means also mountainous areas where building solar PV is completely impossible. So you can use that. You can use a common electrical infrastructure already, so especially transmission lines, the substation in some extent. Uh, which has also a, an impact on the cost. Um, you tackle in production, you tackle the seasonal variation. So on, the, on a rainy season, you would have more hydropower production potentially and, and then no solar. But on the contrary, on a, on a very dry season, you would have a lot of solar production and then you can save water, which becomes a bit more uh, tricky. Um, 
You have your reservoir acting as a battery, so the main goal of that is to save water by producing solar from the same asset, uh, and, then, and then use the water again so as, as a battery, but that's the cheapest battery you can find. Uh, water management is increased. Um, you In some extent, and that's the topic of my PhD too, is that you could tackle this PV variability with a flexible hydropower plant. Uh, and flexibility in hydropower is a big topic for hydrocell. Um, so yeah, so you increase generation from the same asset on the, on the operator perspective, and, uh, and infrastructure again, but also roads, uh, maintenance people, uh, the SCADA system, all of that that you can also use in your solar PV plant, uh, which is already existing for your hydropower plant. Yeah, so there is not much yet. Uh, there is one in Portugal, but you can, that one is like 50 kilowatts for a 500 megawatt hydropower plant. So the hybridization, I'm not sure they get a lot of that. Uh, but that's a pilot, that's good, better than nothing. Thailand and Vietnam have, have huge plants uh, sponsored by the Asian Development Bank uh, on many reservoirs, but it's just starting now. And then we have some Norwegians uh, eager to take the market. Uh, Statcraft with this pilot in Albania, so that's a two megawatt again, that's, that's not big, but that's a pilot. They want to test the mechanical part of the technology. And, uh, and uh, in the Philippines, that's SN uh, something, that's a joint venture between SN Power, a uh, Norwegian actor, and this uh, Philippines uh, actor. Piloting also, 200 kilowatts, so that's nothing but uh, piloting the stuff. Yeah, so just some words about my PhD. I started in March with summer ferry and stuff, so that's the very beginning of that. Expecting a completion in spring 2022. I'm gonna go to Singapore in January for eight months uh, to investigate that with Ceres, with uh, the one that did the numbers there. And the main goal is to do some techno-economic optimization. Um, because if the, uh, just say it very simple, uh, if the solar PV plant is too big, you're gonna, you're gonna curtail a lot of it and then your investment will be impacted. So, um, how big it can be to manage, to increase water management without being too big. So there's this kind of uh, long-term planning in, in water management. Yeah, so I won't go in details into that. Um, and then in terms of equipment also, we, we, I mentioned the, the variability of solar PV and how it could be tackled in a way by hydropower, what kind of equipment suits best, because that's, again, some kind of rehabilitation process for existing hydropower plants with some high resolution dynamic study because of course ramp rates can be quite heavy in solar PV so how do you, how do you manage that so that your, your turbine generator or your machine can contact that. That's it, just a glimpse. If you have ideas, if you're uh, into that, please come to me. Thanks. <laughs>